It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Alfred Kentergern Sievers. He teaches at Bucknell University and is a student at the Pastoral School in Chicago. And his presentation, as you can see, is on St. Sergius of Radonezh and the language of creation. Uh, Vladika, <clears throat> Vladika, Father Luke, Reverend Fathers, uh, future pastors and brothers and sisters, it's a blessing to be here today. Uh, my talk is based uh, partly on my work, which is both in literature and environmental studies. One striking aspect of the life of St. Sergius of Radnesh by Epiphanius the Wise in the early 15th century and its later revision is the presence of the natural world of the forest. The life of a saint, of course, is not a work of nature writing as understood in any secular environmental sense today. This paper's title is not meant to indicate a pagan personification of nature, but rather a type of language or meaningfulness found in the relation between God and man in creation. The meaningfulness of creation in the word that is God. Indeed, St. Sergius's interactions with creation in his life are very much entwined with hesychasm, a transfigurative sense of the word in relation to the embodied experience of man, men, and an emphasis on the all-holy trinity as the ultimate mystery of relation at the source of all things. There is an important sense in St. Sergius's life of a relation between the word that is God, the words of God with inspired words of holiness, and creation. This legacy is reflected in how the natural world has been an important part of Russian Orthodox spirituality and an important part of engagement between the coming of Orthodoxy to Russian Alaska and American culture's concerns with nature. The Church Fathers talk about creation as one way of at least beginning an approach to God through experience of the grandeur and order of life even in our fallen world. St. Gregory of Nyssa wrote of how creation can be experienced as a type of meaningful music akin to the chanting of the Psalms, a music or harmony that finds its origins in God. Hesychastic and liturgical practices include the physical chanting of words as embodying a harmony and meaningfulness that is both noetic and transfigurative of our lives on the earth. But today in the secular realm of modern culture, we see often an emphasis on the meaninglessness of the natural world. Dostoevsky wrote of how once modern intellectuals challenged the existence of God, they went on to challenge the existence of nature. Recovering a meaningful or even a moral sense of nature is a concern of some environmental writers and thinkers today. Environmental semiotics as a field of study emerged from lands whose cultures were influenced by orthodoxy, and particularly by Russian monasticism in the legacy of St. Sergius. Biosemiotics and ecosemiotics view the natural world as based in information exchange and communication. They emerged primarily from Tartu University in Estonia and from what has been called the Tartu Moscow School of Semiotics. In the development of such studies, we see some important figures such as Mikhail Bakhtin with connections to orthodoxy, along with others in the circle of the martyred father Pavel Florensky. Others in these scholarly efforts to, an exa to examine an embodied sense of semiotics and language have included Arizm Kohak, a Czech phenomenologist, and Julia Kristeva, a Bulgarian writer on semiotics. Their efforts have pushed back against a materialistic, neo-Darwinist view of the physical world. They argue in favor of accepting an immaterial as well as a material side to nature. For secularists, that, that immaterial aspect includes communication, information exchange, signs, symbolism, relationships, and even language in terms of rhetoric and poetics, which cannot be found under a microscope. Such exchange of meaningful information in their view can include DNA at a biological level or the way in which plants and animals communicate through different kinds of signs such as color and pollination of plants. In the tradition of the church, of course, we are given a much deeper sense of the language of creation. 
by church fathers such as St. Maximus the Confessor. St. Maximus wrote of how the Logi of the Logos, or the words of the Word, both constitute and redeem creation. Indeed, he identifies those words of God at times with the energies of God in his Ambigua. In Ambiguum 7, for example, the Confessor discusses the Logi of our being that exist eternally in God. In Ambiguum 22, he writes of how science fails to provide an, a, quote, understanding of how God, who is truly none of the things that exist, and who properly speaking is all things, and at the same time beyond them, is present in the logos of each thing in itself, and in all the logi together, according to which all things exist, end quote. That patristic teaching on the mystery of God's language of creation can be the point of departure for us in understanding the significance of St. Sergius's legacy in this area. Remembering the spectrum of meaning for the Greek logos provides a helpful basis too, in terms of how logos can mean at once word, harmony, reason, story, discourse, and purpose. St. John of Damascus described the incarnation as the thickening of the word into image, which he saw as typed by iconography. And the meaning of logos also as harmony shows an incarnational aspect in the embodied expression of hymnody and hesychasm. Let us examine more specifically how St. Sergius's life presents what can be called this language of creation in orthodox terms, before briefly relating this back again to contemporary concerns in terms of his legacy. <clears throat> the opening of the life after telling of his family background, the living story into which he was born, tells of his childhood encounter while searching for a lost foal with a venerable elder, a monk priest with the appearance of an angel. He tells the stranger of his desire to understand holy scriptures and his inability to learn how to read and write and to gain understanding of book learning. The monk raised his hands and eyes toward heaven, prayed, and then handed to the boy what appeared to be a little bit of white wheaten bread of the holy sacrament. He told the boy, take this in thy mouth, child, and eat. This is given thee as a sign of God's grace and for the understanding of holy scriptures. Though the gift appears but small, the taste thereof is very sweet. We're told the boy ate, tasting a sweetness like honey. And then Bartholomew said, Is it not written, How sweet are thy words to my palate, more than honey to my lips, and my soul doth cherish them exceedingly? The monk answers that if Bartholomew believes, more will be revealed to him, and not to worry about reading and writing. Thou wilt find that from this day forth the Lord will give thee learning. The boy prostrates himself to the monk and asks him to come home with him, which the monk does. At the chapel at Bartholomew's home, before eating, the monk begins a recitation of the hours and asks Bartholomew to read the Psalms. The monk tells him, read the word of God, nothing doubting. The boy begins to recite in excellent rhythm. Afterward, the parents told the monk of another embodied sign, how Bartholomew, while in the womb, had three times cried out during liturgy and told of their fear about this. The monk interpreted this for them, saying, The boy will be great before God and man, thanks to his life of godliness. Then he departed their house, giving what's called a dark saying that their son would serve the Holy Trinity and would lead many to an understanding of the divine precepts. The mysterious stranger at the doorway became suddenly invisible, and the parents wondered whether he had been an angel. Afterward, the boy could read any book, we are told, and was changed, being obedient in all things to his parents, attending church services assiduously while disciplining his body ascetically. There is a connection in these accounts of St. Sergius's youth between the embodied signs of the holy bread and the young Bartholomew's ability through God's grace to read and chant the Psalms, and then other texts, and the impact on his life of asceticism. The words of God from a scriptural quote are identified with an incarnational sweet taste of more than honey to the lips, an embodied sense of God's language of creation. The chanting of the Psalms is Bartholomew's first experience of reading. St. Gregory of Nyssa wrote in On the Interpretation of the Psalms that, quote, the order of the universe is a kind of musical harmony of varied shapes and colors with a certain order and rhythm, 
the song woven together with divine words, unquote. There is another kind of sign here also, the sign of Bartholomew's crying out three times from his mother's womb during liturgy, signifying his service to and leading others in service to the All-Holy Trinity. This was another expression of the embodied language of God manifest in creation in incarnational terms, interpreted to the family by the mysterious stranger. Such signs are known from other saints' lives and perhaps are in part types of the ultimate fulfillment of the embodied word in the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ, depicted in the Theotokos of the sign, icons of the Annunciation of the Word Made Flesh. Probably the most famous example of this type of icon, the wonder-working Kursk root icon of Our Lady of the Sign, has of course its own associations with Russia and the natural world. Associated anciently with a tree, as its name indicates, and a spring, it was rediscovered in a forest at a time of Tatar domination, circa 1300. The icon then often alternated seasonally between a hermitage monastic church, near where it was found in the woods, and the cursed cathedral and monastery bearing its name. The next part of St. Sergius's life describes his own movement to the forest and the way in which that move developed into a thriving monastic community and helped to stimulate the spread of monasticism into the northern forests of what became Russia. Those forests became known, like the ocean and its islands around the Irish and North Seas in the west, as a desert, and sometimes have been called the northern Tebide in reference to deserts of Egyptian monasticism. We are told how Barth Bartholomew and his brother searched for a desert place in many parts of the forest, until finally they came to a clearing near a stream, and obeying the voice of God were satisfied. His brother reminded him that God gave a sign before he was born in the three cries that he would lead others to believe in the All-Holy Trinity, to which the chapel in the woods was dedicated. We are told that everywhere on all sides were forest and wilderness where the saintly desert lover and desert dwellers stayed. The saint requested tonsuring as a monk, being given the name Sergius, while saying, I thirst as the heart thirsteth for the springs of the living water, another reference to God's incarnational signs in both scripture and creation. Living alone in the wilderness, we are told that a bearer used to come to the holy man and became a kind of companion. The saint was studying scripture and growing in asceticism, and others came to join him. We are told the forest was not far distant from it as, it as it now is. The shade and the murmur of trees hung above the cells. Around the church was a space of trunks and stumps. Here many kinds of vegetables were sown. A couple further observations on St. Sergius's legacy in highlighting God's language and creation are relevant here. One is his interaction with the bear, a wild animal tamed by the saint's holiness, the harmonies of a kind of communication otherwise lost to men and animals in the fall from paradise. We also see this in a different way in the vision that the saint receives of a multitude of beautiful birds flying around the monastery's region, a sign of the increase to come in the flock of his disciples across time. Then there is the whole interrelation of scriptural study asceticism, a peaceful interaction with animals, and gardening. Later in the life, the saint is famously found gardening by a visitor who cannot believe he is the abbot until he is corrected by a visiting prince. We see the saint's use of a real-life parable, so to speak, the inability of the visitor to recognize the holy elder he seeks because of his clothes and gardening, to teach a lesson that affects the man so that he becomes a monk also in service, we are told, to the Holy Trinity. These accounts, these living parables, or, or perhaps a kind of embodied iconography of the friendship with the bear, the gardening abbot, and the spectrum of St. Sergius's scriptural study with his ascetic life, all include a certain kind of meaningful interaction and interpretation of creation. Gardening, with its ultimate roots in the paradise of Eden, also has been used as a metaphor for biological semiotics today, for the way in which meaningful human life is shaped by the physical environment, but also shapes it. Orthodox Christians understand this in light of the incarnation, in which God's rules for his household of creation, even in its fallen state, are communicated through his energies and his economia. 
The idea of God's economia and the shared root with our modern English word economy leads to one last point in this brief outline from the life of St. Sergius, and that is how his legacy in relation to the language of creation involves a sense of sustainability. The core root of economia means household, and the whole term means the laws of the household, in orthodoxy meaning God's rule of his household creation. In secular terms, economy refers to the household of society. It overlaps with ecumene as a term for the inhabited earth, and ecology, whose roots mean the story of the household. An overlap between God's laws of the household, the earth as household, and God's story of the household can be seen in St. Sergius's life as well. We're told that St. Sergius's abbot himself baked the holy bread. First he flayed and ground the wheat, sifted the flour, kneaded and fermented the dough, the same bread involved in his originally gaining the gift of reading. He taught by example the monks to have the Psalms of David all day on their lips. For the first years at least, the monks sang matins at dawn with no light save that of a single birch or pine torch. Although wilderness surrounded the monastery at first, we're told that within the first years, Christians began coming to live around it, and the forest was cut down and a plain created with a village. Interestingly, the life, life notes that the forest was cut down and there was no one to prevent it, implying perhaps both that the attraction of the monastery to people at large could not be prevented because it was from God, but also perhaps the absence of civil authority to preserve even part of the forest. However, the account makes clear that even in what might be called the growth of a kind of urban environment in microcosm around the monastery, parallel to what are called proto-urban areas in early monastic Ireland, gardening forms a central part of the life of the community, representing a continuing meaningful exchange with the natural world in a personal way, what today might be called urban agrarianism. In the later accounts in the life, we do see the importance of the civil authority absent in the earlier cutting down of the forest in St. Sergius's prayers for the Grand Prince Dimitri against the Tatars, involving the significance of a Christian society as a meaningful environment that would help shape what can be called the natural world of generations of Christians to come growing up in what would become Russia. We also read of the saint's self-control and ascetic sacrifice during a shortage of food at the monastery, and the way that through God's grace and philanthropy, bread was supplied and his clairvoyance in knowing beforehand of this provision, which continued across three days. God provides for everything, and neither does he abandon this place, the saint counseled the monks. In modern America, some new agrarian writers speak of the definition of sustainability as the overlapping of economy and ecology. Yet in orthodox terms, we might think of that in terms of the overlapping of God's economia with the meaningfulness of God's creation in terms of human community. The Byzantine idea of symphonia suggests this, together theological, theologically with synergy. Certainly, St. Sergius has interaction in the life with the church in Byzantium, where symphonia involved the balance of church and state in the household of human society in the natural world. This is seen in the letter that the life describes the saint receiving from the Patriarch of Constantinople as a kind of charter for his monastery approved by Metropolitan Alexis in an era of emerging unity for what became the Russian Empire. The result of that letter as told in the life was establishment of an actual monastic community with common property and with an emphasis on how the poor and all strangers were be to be allowed to rest in the monastery and no suppliant to be refused so including a caring for the larger social household, so to speak. Thus again, a spiritually meaningful sense of human community on earth can be interpreted partly as another expression of a highlighting of God's language and creation in St. Sergius's legacy. As an aside, a few years ago in our environmental studies program, a group of us from my college visited the headquarters of the Iroquois Confederacy near Syracuse, not far from here. The Native American leader of the Confederacy was asked what was America's main environmental problem. He replied to the shock of most of my academic colleagues 
that the main environmental problem in the United States was the separation of church and state in the American system, because in his view, it had aided the removal of a sense of meaningfulness from the natural world, which was interesting to hear from that Native American leader. Throughout the life, St. Sergius is associated in particular with service to the Holy Trinity and leading many to an understanding of the divine precepts. This can be seen in the influence across generations of the monastery he founded, dedicated, as is this one to the whole, as is this one here to the Holy Trinity, and in the famous icon of the Holy Trinity, based on the biblical account of the hospitality of Abraham, written by St. Sergius's younger contemporary at the monastery, St. Andre Rublev. The connection between serving the Holy Trinity and leading understanding of the divine precepts in St. Sergius's legacy relates to an understanding of the language of God's words or energies in creation. And this creation could be seen as a kind of iconography relating the words of God. We can see this typed in the Trinitarian pattern of language advanced in today's fields of biosemiotics and ecosemiotics as developed at Tartu. Their triadic models of embodied language and signs in the physical world are based in the works of the 19th century American semiotician Charles Peirce. Peirce was influenced by medieval Christian philosophy, perhaps softened by Native American philosophy. Because of the, tri and, uh, because of the triadic pattern of meaning Peirce saw in nature, he converted from Unitarianism to Trinitarian Episcopalianism, kind of bucking the trend among American intellectuals at that time. Peirce wrote of how the creator of the world is, quote, a personal being for the same reason that all symbols are personal, but also further the wellspring of all personality, end quote. The Trinity helped shape his view of basic communication in the universe as a kind of type for the uh, Trinity. To Peirce, the self is formed in an interaction of meaning between the sign or text, the reality or object, and the interpretant or subject. This triad brings together text or logos and reality in a kind of pattern or landscape in which personhood emerges in the making of meaning. Peirce's triadic model was rediscovered and renewed by the Tartu Moscow Semiotic School in the 20th century. It contrasts with the generally accepted Western model of semiotics based in the binary of Fernand de Saussure uh, which draws on Augustinian theories, going back to some of um, uh, Augustine's writings. Um, the binary model uh, emphasized in more Gnostic terms the arbitrary and internalized interaction of signified and signifier within the human mind. And this again became the, the primary model for semiotics in the West. For Peirce, the triadic nature of language was a type of the Trinity. From an orthodox standpoint, Perhaps we might see a partial typology here in which the real could be somehow paralleled with the Father, the sign with the Son, and the interpretant with the Holy Spirit. Uh, Julia Kristeva points out that the binary nature of the filioque in the West forms a pattern for binarized Western thinking at odds with a triadic view of language and nature in Orthodox Christianity. The binary model shapes an opposition between human culture and nature or the human mind and the physical world. The triadic view for Peirce and Kristeva helped shape a meaningful and personal sense of nature, which Kohak called a moral sense of nature. <coughs> so to return at the conclusion to the life of St. Sergius, uh, this is what we see in the saint's life and his interactions with the natural world and what could be called in orthodox terms the language of creation and God's uncreated energies or logi. Orthodox theology and practice ex exemplified in St. Sergius's legacy provides us with deep experiential insights regarding the language of creation as God's words or energies, transfiguring our embodied lives as Christians and opening deeper meanings of sustainability and of the expressions of God's will on earth as in heaven. Thank you.